a reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. Azariah stood up in the fire and prayed aloud, For your name's sake, O Lord, do not deliver us up forever, or make void your covenant. Do not take away your mercy from us, for the sake of Abraham, your beloved, Isaac, your servant, and Israel, your holy one, to whom you promised to multiply their offspring like the stars of heaven or the sand on the shore of the sea. For we are reduced, O Lord, beyond any other nation, brought low everywhere in the world this day because of our sins. We have in our day no prince, prophet, or leader, no burnt offering, sacrifice, oblation, or incense, no place to offer first fruits to find favor with you. But with contrite heart and humble spirit let us be received, as though it were burnt offerings of rams and bullocks, or thousands of fat lambs. So let our sacrifice be in your presence today, as we follow you unreservedly. For those who trust in you cannot be put to shame. And now we follow you with our whole heart. We fear you and we pray to you. Do not let us be put to shame, but deal with us in your kindness and great mercy. Deliver us by your wonders and bring glory to your name, O Lord. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Your ways, O Lord, make known to me. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Remember that your compassion, O Lord, and your kindness are from of old. In your kindness remember me because of your goodness, O Lord. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, thus he shows sinners the way. He guides the humble to justice. He teaches the humble his way. Remember your mercies, O Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Peter approached Jesus and said to him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him who owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of paying it back, His master ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, his children, and all his property, in payment of the debt. At that the servant fell down, did him homage, and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back in full. Moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and forgave him the loan. When that servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a much smaller amount. He seized him and started to choke him, demanding, Pay back what you owe. Falling to his knees, his fellow servant begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had him put in prison until he paid back the debt. Now, when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply disturbed and went to their master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? Then in anger his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly Father do to you, unless each of you forgives your brother from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. 
but he refused. This gospel parable about forgiveness warns us of something we do too often. We refuse to forgive our brothers and sisters. Now, this is obviously a very important commandment of Jesus. We need to understand what it is and what it isn't. Forgiving someone does not mean, first of all, justifying what they did. If someone did wrong against you, what's wrong is still wrong, what's right is still right, even if you forgive them. So it's not to justify wrongdoing. It's not to invite them to do it again or give them permission to do it again. Nor is it the abandonment of one's right to restitution. I can forgive someone for having done wrong. I can choose to set them free of the debt of restitution. Or I can say, I forgive you. I don't hold anything against you. But give me back what you stole. Or restore my reputation because of something you said. Say something good now to make it right. The right to restitution is still there. And it's not a lack of virtue to insist on it. Nor is forgiveness having warm and fuzzy feelings for the person who hurt us and being becoming their friend. I don't have to be friends with the person I forgive. It's probably going to be very difficult to do so. What does it mean? Jesus says in another passage, The Lord makes the sun shine on the good and the bad, the rain fall on the just and the unjust. And we read in Scripture too, God wants all to be saved. Forgiveness means we maintain the attitude that we want good for that person and we don't make the wrong that they've done to us a reason to change that attitude. We want what is good for them. We don't wish evil on them. We don't return evil for evil. Scripture again reminds us of this in various passages. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I will repay. God is the judge. We need to realize that we are in debt to the Master. And that's where this parable comes in. We are the one who owes the huge amount. One commentator has said the huge amount translated from the original language here of the Scriptures is $9 million. We're the ones who owe the huge amount to God because of our sins. It's impossible to put a number, to put a measure on the, on the evil of sin. Because remember, you're offending an infinitely good God. The gravity of an offense is proportional to the nature of the one who's offended. We're talking about offending the almighty, all-holy God. So there's no measure to sin. So we owe a huge debt that we could never repay, we are totally begging the mercy of God, and He gives it to us. He gives it to us through the actual historical event that we're preparing during Lent to celebrate, the crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Christ. The Master forgave our debt. So we are the ones, we are the servants, running out from the Master's uh, presence, happy, that He has forgiven us, and then encountering our fellow servants who owe us a fraction, because they've sinned against us. That's not the same as sinning against God. They owe us a fraction. And are we going to follow the example of the Master who just forgave us and be generous in forgiving them? Or will we behave like the one in this parable who would have none of it and the, the translated amount that the fellow servant owed him was $15. $15 owed to a person who had just been forgiven a debt of $9 million. You know, we say the Our Father, 
And it's a dangerous prayer to say if we're not willing to forgive. Because in it, we are asking God to use us as the model for His forgiveness. We want Him to use us as the example of how He is to treat us. And He says the same thing here. Your Father will treat you in exactly the same way as the Master treated this unforgiving servant unless you forgive. So we say in the Our Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It doesn't mean while we forgive those. It means in the same way, in the same measure with which we forgive those who trespass against us. With the same eagerness, with the same willingness, with the same generosity. Lord, if you watch me and you see that I'm not generous in forgiving, well then don't be generous in forgiving me. That's what we're saying to God when we say the Our Father. So if we're going to say it, and we say it every day, let's be ready to forgive. You know, if you don't forgive somebody who has done wrong to you, you're giving that person too much power over you. Because God is saying that now your lack of forgiveness is interfering with your relationship with Him. Why give another person that kind of power over your relationship with God? That kind of power over your spiritual destiny, your spiritual well-being. Don't let them have that authority. You may not be able to change them or deter them from their wicked ways, although sometimes forgiveness does have that effect, but at least you can keep them from interfering with the most important relationship in your life, that with Almighty God. You can go to God in peace of mind and conscience and heart and say, Lord, I've forgiven this person. Maybe the person continues to do you harm. But you can be at peace and secure in your relationship with God because you have not turned your heart away from your enemy. No, you pray for your enemy. You wish only salvation for your enemy. You don't have to be their friend. And you certainly don't justify what they did. But it's like, Lord... I'm interested in no wrongdoing or vengeance. I forgive, I pray for, I want the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike, because you are the judge, and you indeed will repay in due time. Give us that grace, Lord God, of Lenten forgiveness to others, so that we may enjoy the forgiveness you want to give to us. Amen.